Hi, my name is Kyle, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of getting the popular game framework Monogame set up on your computer, as well as cover the core fundamentals of how to use it. First, we'll need to get Visual Studio installed, and then grab the latest version of Monogame. I'll then show you how to create new projects, how the code is organized, and how to manage your game assets using the pipeline tool. And finally, we'll start the process of creating our own original game, which will utilize several key aspects of game development, like drawing graphics to the screen, displaying text, keeping score, storing data and variables, and reading mouse input from the player. Simple concepts like these are the foundation of any game, and there's no better way to learn them than by starting a project ourselves. So whenever you're ready, let's get started. We're going to go through how to download and install all the software you'll need in order to start developing with Monogame. First, we're going to install Visual Studio, which will be our IDE, or Integrated Development Environment. Basically, this is the program where we'll be writing all of our code. To get this program, you'll want to go to visualstudio.microsoft.com, and then we're going to click on this Download Visual Studio button, and we're going to choose Community. And you'll just choose Community, and then whatever the latest version is, right now it's 2019 for me. And the download should start automatically. There it is. Once that installer is done downloading, you're just going to want to run it and then follow the prompts that come up. And eventually you're going to reach a screen that looks like this. This is where we choose all of our workloads, or basically some different external packages that we want Visual Studio to include. And in this case, there's a few that we would want to click on. Make sure you have .NET Desktop Development enabled. Probably going to want Universal Windows Platform, as well as Xamarin if you ever want to do mobile development. And once you have those selected, you can go ahead and continue on with the installation. Be warned, Visual Studio is very large, and it takes a very long time to download depending on your internet speed. So just keep that in mind. But once it's done downloading and is installed, you're going to want to start it up at least once before the next step. It's important that it runs at least once before we go over here to monogame.net. Now this is going to be where we download monogame. You go to monogame.net, we'll go over to this download section, and we're going to choose our most recent release, which is 3.7.1 for me. If I go here, I know the, the download process changes a little bit. Sometimes it starts to download immediately, but for here I had one more thing to click. I'm going to choose Monogame 3.7.1 for Visual Studio. Once this finishes downloading, we can go ahead and run the installer. Click Next. I agree. And then here we need to specify our templates. And this is very important in order for this to work with Visual Studio. For us, or at least for me, I downloaded Visual Studio 2019. That means that I need to choose the Visual Studio 2019 templates over here. If that's there for you, you can go ahead and click on that and click Install. However, for me, those templates aren't here. And this is common whenever Visual Studio releases a new version, like now, Visual Studio 2019 recently released. And when this happens, Monogame may not have these templates ready when we go to install it. And when this happens, we kind of need to do a little workaround for this. So again, if they're there for you, just go ahead and enable it and click install. But if it's not there for you, what we need to do is we need to go to our documents folder. And you'll find this Visual Studio 2019 folder, or whichever version you're using. What we're going to do is going to copy this and paste it to create a copy of it and we're going to rename this to Visual Studio 2017. Basically we're going to trick this installer into thinking that we have 2017 installed. That way when we rerun this installer we can have this enabled. Now that this is checked, we can click Install. And now, when we go back to that Visual Studio 2017 folder we created, 
If we go in and go to Templates, Project Templates, and Visual C Sharp, we have our Monogame folder. This is what that installer just created for us. These are the templates, and we can see them all here. So now all we have to do is copy this folder. Now we'll go back to our Visual Studio 2019 folder, go to Templates, Project Templates, Visual C Sharp, and then we'll paste our Monogame folder in. So now all these templates are available in Visual Studio 2019. We can verify that this works if we go to Visual Studio. You may have to restart it actually, but we can go over to create a new project and this has all of our templates across every platform. Now the monogame templates we installed should be in here. We can go up to the search bar at the top and search for monogame and there they are. The installation process worked. When it comes time for you to create your own monogame project, you're going to be using this monogame windows project. And with that, everything's installed, you're ready to move on. In order to create games with monogame, you'll need to know how to program with C sharp. If this is something you are not familiar with, then I would recommend checking out my full course on udemy.com titled monogame introduction to C sharp game programming. This course has several sections devoted to learning programming fundamentals with C sharp and they assume no prior technical knowledge, so anyone can go through these lectures and learn everything that's needed. There's a link to the course in the description, and using this link will automatically apply a discount code, so be sure to check it out. In order to demonstrate some of the key fundamentals of using Monogame, we're going to go through the process of creating our own game. This is what the final version will look like. It's a basic shooting gallery game, where the target appears and you have to shoot it as many times as you can in the amount of time that you're given. And each time you shoot it, your score goes up, and eventually the game will end. Although this may look pretty basic, it covers a lot of the important aspects of game development. Drawing graphics to the screen, keeping score, making use of real time, and using the mouse to click on things. Understanding these basics will set you up nicely to continue on to something even better. By the end of this video, we will cover most of the functionality for this game. So whenever you're ready, let's get started. To start us off, we're going to go ahead and create our very first monogame project in Visual Studio. So we can go up to File, New, Project, or you can just click on the Create a New Project button if you're on the home screen. And then this brings up all of our templates. Now since we're creating a monogame project, we're going to want to go up to the search bar and we can search for monogame and they'll all be here. Next we need to choose the correct one and we're going to want to choose the template that corresponds to our operating system. In my case I'm on Windows, so I'm going to choose the monogame Windows project. Click next. Now we need to give our project a name. I'm going to name mine shooting gallery. And then now we need to make sure we keep track of where our project is being stored. In my case, it's being stored in my users, user source repos folder. Then you can go ahead and check this box if you don't already. And we can click create. And it should take just a second for it to finish up. And when it looks like it's all done, go ahead and click on this game1.cs. This file will act as the home base for our project. A lot of the core mechanics comes from this file, and actually for our first game, everything's going to go in this file. It's good practice to separate your code between different files, but while we're learning with this smaller scale game, I think it's best if we keep it simple and locate it all in one place. Now depending on your version of Monogame, your game1.cs may look a little bit different from mine, but that's totally fine. What we're going to do is actually delete some of this unnecessary stuff, which includes all these comments like summary, we don't really need these right now. So I'm going to go through and delete these. We can leave the to do's, that's no big deal. Getting rid of these will make the file a bit more compact so it's easier to get around it. And once you're done, don't forget to save.
It's always good practice to save really frequently when in, whenever you're developing your game, so be sure to uh, click the save button or control S just once in a while so you don't lose anything in case uh, the program shuts down or something. So after all that's done, we're left with the core layout of a mono game project. You can see that it's kind of separated between sections, like we have this section and this section. These are all different methods, and each of these methods do different things. And what we're going to do is we add our own code to these methods, and that makes the code that we write execute in different parts of the game. And that's what each of these to-dos talk about. It says what kind of code you should put in each of these spots, like initialization, initialization logic, and load content is load content in the game. A lot of these are pretty self-explanatory, but we're still going to go through them in more detail. We'll start up at the top with this, game one. This is known as the game constructor. We'll get more into what a constructor is in a later programming lecture, but what you need to know about this section is that it's in here where we set up the basic settings for our game. Like we can set the window size in here, or we can change whether or not the mouse is visible in the game window. Simple features like that. So we're putting a little bit of code in here for the first game. This next section is initialize. This section of code occurs right when the game starts, and you use it to load certain content in your game. But we actually are not going to be using that right now. The kind of things you would load using this section isn't required for this first game, so we're just going to ignore it. Now, load content is a very useful section to us. Here is where you load all of your images, sounds, and other pieces of content into your game. Our shooting gallery game is going to have several images that we're going to use, so we'll be using this a little bit in the coming lectures. This unload content method is one where you can unload content, obviously, as the name implies, and you would do that if you had any assets that weren't going to be present throughout the entire game. For all the games we're developing in this course, it will not be necessary, so we will not be touching that. However, if you're building a larger scale game where, say, one level has uh, this background image but another level doesn't, it would be wise to unload that first image since you wouldn't be using it in the second level. This next method is update. This is where the interesting stuff for our game happens. What update is is the game loop. This section of code runs every frame of our game. In Monogame, the projects we make run by default at 60 frames per second, so that means that this section of code will run 60 times every second, once for every frame. Knowing this, we can put code in here that needs to be constantly updated. Lastly, we have our Draw section. In here, we're going to put anything that involves drawing stuff to the screen. If we wanted to show a target in the game window, we would put our code to do that in here. Now this section is similar to the update section in that it also runs every frame. However, this part is used solely for drawing images and text. You wouldn't want to perform any calculations or change any variables in here. You would instead do that in update. And that takes care of each of our sections. We have the constructor, which handles some basic game settings. We have initialize, which is used for initialization logic, which we'll get into that later. We have load content, where all of our assets get loaded into the game, like images and sounds and other kind of assets that a game needs. We have unload content, where you would take content out of the game. We have update, which runs every single frame and is used for calculations. And we have draw, which is also run every frame, but is used for drawing uh, images and text to the screen. In the next lecture, we're going to go over how to load assets into the game. And in the following lecture, we'll talk about how to display those assets to the screen in the game window. At that point, we're going to do a little experiment to show how each of these different sections interact with each other in order to make a game possible. Let's get started with actually building our game. The first thing we're going to work on is getting our art assets included into the project. And there are four different things we want to include. We have three images one for the crosshairs, one for the sky background, and one for the target, and we also have this font file. In order to get these into our game folder, we need to utilize Monogame's content pipeline. All of these assets need to be converted into a new type of file in order for them to work with Monogame, and that's exactly what the pipeline can do for us. Back in Visual Studio over here on the side, if we bring down this content folder, we see we have a content.mgcb. Now, you might not have the, this little image right here for the monogame symbol, 
But uh, regardless, I want you to right click on this and choose open with. Then I want you to, s there's a bunch of different options here, but you're gonna wanna scroll down and find this monogame pipeline tool and then set it as default and then click okay. When you do that now, um, all you have to do is double click on this in order to open up the pipeline. But once it starts up, we're gonna make it a little bit bigger so we can see it. This is how we're gonna be loading assets into the game. Go ahead and first click on this content item up here and you'll see that there's a platform option. Make sure that the platform matches whichever operating system you're on. For me, I'm on Windows, so it's correct right now, but if you're on Mac or something else, you would uh, bring down this drop window and choose whichever platform you're developing on. Now, to add the assets, you can right-click on this content item right here, choose Add, and then Existing Item. This is going to bring you to an explorer, and we need to locate those files that you downloaded. Now, I, I recommend that you store those files just somewhere on your computer, somewhere safe. Like, I have mine in um, somewhere in the documents folder. That would be totally fine. The point is, we're going to be linking to these files or copying them into the content pipeline. So once you have all the files available to you, we're going to select all of them and then choose Open. And this, is, this next part is up to you. You can either copy all these files into the content folder in your project, which is what I'm going to do. It's just going to make a whole new instance of this asset and make it exclusive to Visual Studio here. Or you can link to it, which would mean that if you ever want to change one of these assets, like you wanted to change the target to a blue target or something, all you'd have to do is edit that original image, and then it would be updated in Monogame as well. The thing is, though, I like having separate ones between the original and what we're using with our game project, so I'm just going to do copy. Again, completely up to you. And then if you use the same action for all selected files, then we won't have to click OK four different times. And there they are. They're all right here. Now the next step is we need to make sure that we save. So the content pipeline keeps track of all the files that we're including into our game. So make sure you save. And then next we have to click on this build button. Now what building does is it takes all these files like a PNG and a sprite font and it's going to convert them all into a new kind of file type and we're going to go check those out in just a moment. Once it's done building, we're done with the pipeline for now. So we can X out of that. Then there's a couple more steps. We need to actually put them into this content folder here. So we're going to go to right click on content folder, click add and choose existing item brings up another explorer. So this is the this is where our project is actually stored. See here's game1.cs and then here's the content folder. We want to go into content, then bin, and then it's going to have whatever operating system you built to, so a Windows. And then it's not going to show anything in here right now, but what you need to do is you need to go down here and choose all files. And here they are. These are all the assets we included except they're now as XNB files. These are what Monogame needs in order to use all those assets. So if we select them all and click Add, they're all here. After clicking Add, it might ask you if you want to copy them or link them or whatever. Again, this is completely up to you. Uh, copying them is fine or linking them is fine. I would recommend going with one of those. And now that these are all into our content folder, in the next lecture we're going to learn how to actually take these and display them into our game. We got three images and one sprite font file in our content folder now. So let's go over how to actually get these to display on the screen. We'll start with the images. First thing we need to do is make a new variable for each of the images, and we need to declare them here. Now these variables that we're going to make are the same idea of the variables that we did in the programming section. The only thing that's new is the data type. We'll write in texture 2D target sprite. The data type that we will use for images is called texture2d. Basically it's a two-dimensional image 
or as game developers call them, sprites. So I'll be referring to these image assets as sprites from now on. You may notice that we didn't give this variable a value. Before, we would write something like target sprite equals one or something. Well, you don't actually need to do that right away. So this is a declaration. It just means that we have a variable in our game, but it doesn't have a value yet. We're going to take care of that in the load content section. Now, while we're here, we're also going to add a texture 2D for the crosshairs. So we'll do crosshairs sprite and texture 2D or background sprite. Now let's go down to load content and actually give these variables their values. Remember, the load content section is where we load our art assets into the game. So that explains why we don't do the assignment up at the top. So in here, we're going to write target sprite equals, so we're going to do the initial assignment. Now we need to actually load this X and B file. And to do that, we need to say content.load. Now we have to use these caret symbols right here. And inside the caret symbol, we need to specify the data type of what we're going to load, which is a texture 2D. So content.load and then the data type that we're loading. And then we need to put um, a left and right parentheses. And inside the parentheses, we need to put the name of what we're loading. So over here, we have crosshairs, gallery font, sky, target. We need to choose one of those things in order to put inside target sprite. And since we want this target.x and b, we're going to write quotation marks target, just like that. We don't write target.x and b, we just want the name because they're all x and b files. Now, although this is kind of an odd looking line, this is what we need to do in order to get this file into this variable. And we're going to do the same thing for crosshair sprite equals content.load texture 2D and then it's called cross whoops crosshairs and then background sprite equals content.load texture 2D and it's called sky Now that we have all of our sprites loaded into the game, let's get them drawn. We're going to go down to the draw section, of course, to do this. So we can get rid of this. Now before we get into the drawing portion, let's go ahead and save real quick and run the game to actually see how it works. It's a good idea to run once in a while to make sure that everything's in line and nothing's messed up. So we just have an empty blue window. Now it's blue because of this line right here, graphics divide dot clear, and then it chooses a color and it says cornflower blue. If we wanted, we could change this to any color we want, but this blue is fine because we're not really going to be looking at it. Before we draw the sprites, we need to understand what a sprite batch is. A sprite batch is a tool that Monogame provides for us, and that is what does the actual drawing to the screen. If we go back up to the top of the file, we'll see that uh, the template that we're using automatically declares a sprite batch from the get-go. And it's initialized right here. So we're going to use this sprite batch object in order to draw those images to the screen. We start out by writing sprite batch dot begin like this. So this is a method call that alerts the sprite batch that we're about to draw something. And be sure to end it with a semicolon. And whenever you have a begin, it's always important to put an end as well, like this. So now, in between this begin and end, we're going to actually have the sprite batch do some drawing. And we do that by writing sprite batch dot draw. And now this is another method, and this is the draw method from sprite batch that actually puts an image onto the screen. Now it takes a few parameters. The first one. It actually tells you right here what the parameters of once are. So the first one is a texture or a texture 2D. In other words, which sprite are we wanting to draw? And we'll start by drawing the target. So we're going to write target sprite. Then the next thing it wants is, it actually says it wants a rectangle, but there's a bunch of different options here. 
The one we're going to use is actually this one, vector2 position. We'll go over what a vector2 is in just a moment, but what you need to write is vector or new vector2 and then 0, 0. And then finally, it wants a color. So we're going to write color.white, kind of like what the color.cornflower blue did. We're just going to write color.white. Um, what this color.white does is it could potentially tint the image a certain color. Since our target is red and white, if we tinted it yellow or something, it would just become more yellowish to it. But when we do white, it doesn't really tint it at all, because if you tint something with a white color, nothing really changes about it. And this is all we need to get that sprite drawn to the screen. So if we save and then run once more, our target sprite is drawn right up here in the corner. So it worked. Now in the next lecture, we're going to go into a little more detail to understand what we actually did here. For, and most importantly, what this vector2 means, because I just threw that at you without really explaining it. I want to talk more in detail about why the spritebatch.draw did what it did. It takes in three different parameters. It takes in a texture 2D, which is our sprite. It takes in a vector 2, and it takes in a color. But I want to talk more about this vector 2, because we haven't really discussed what that does. In this context, it's being used to describe the position in the game world that the sprite will be drawn at. To better illustrate this, I'm going to start the game real quick in order to actually show you what I mean. So we have our target right here. And as we specified in the vector 2, we have it drawn at 0, 0. So this is 0, 0. Basically, a vector 2 describes an ordered pair. And this is similar to what you would do in like a high school math class. You have an x-axis that goes left and right, and you have a y-axis that goes up and down. And this is exactly what this is describing. This first zero describes how far to the right our sprite will be drawn, and then this next zero describes how far down our sprite will be drawn. So it's exactly that. It's just an ordered pair, and it describes that. So since we say zero, zero, that puts us at the origin, which in monogame is the upper left-hand corner of the screen. We're going to try something real quick. Let's, instead of drawing it at zero, zero, let's change this to 150. Zero. So our target is now drawn to the right more than it was before. In fact, it's drawn 150 pixels to the right from the origin. Now what would happen if we change this 0 also to 150? Now this is where it gets a little bit different from like your high school math classes. This is still the y value, but it moves it down. See, in a high school math class, the y-axis increases upwards. So the higher the value, the more up your point will be. However, in monogame, it's actually how far down. So the y-axis increases downwards. That's why at point 150, 150, our target sprite is being, to the, is being drawn to the right 150 pixels and down 150 pixels. So that should explain how the grid system in Monogame works, and how we utilize this new Vector2 right here. Vector2s are very useful, and we'll be using them a lot throughout all of our games, especially when it comes to describing a position, since it's so perfect for it, since it has an X and a Y value. Another thing I'd like to demonstrate is what would happen if we change this color.white to something different, like, say, color.green. There's a whole bunch of different colors that we can choose from, but I'm just going to choose green, simple. Like I said, that this, this tints the image that we're going to draw. And since I chose green, our target is tinted green. All that red is now much darker, and the white has turned just green. That's why choosing color.white tends to be the go-to choice, since when you tint something with the color white, it doesn't change the coloring at all. Now that we have a better understanding of how drawing works, let's go ahead and draw the background. We can actually copy this line right here, because it's pretty much the same thing, and we're going to put it above this first call. Now there's a reason I'm putting it above here, and I'll go over that in just a moment. But this time we're going to be drawing the background sprite, and we want to draw it at 0 .00. 0. So if we save and run the game now, we 
we now get a nice sky background. And that's because first we draw the background sprite, which is just a very large image that will take up the whole window. And then we're drawing the target sprite at 0.150, 150. Now, what would happen if we instead took this draw call and put it after the target sprite? So we're drawing the target first, then we draw the background. If we save and then run, it should look a little bit different because draw order matters. See, now our target's gone. We didn't really change anything. We just drew the target first and then drew the background. Well, the thing is, the target is still being drawn. It's still at point 150, 150. You just can't see it because the background is covering it up. See, in Monogame and most other game engines, the draw order matters because whatever you draw after will cover up what you draw first. It's kind of like a paint canvas. If I painted my canvas the color red, like the entire canvas was red, then I painted the entire canvas blue, that red paint's still there, but you can't see the red paint at all because the blue is covering it up. That's exactly what's happening here. The target's there, it's just we painted the entire canvas with a big background sprite, so it's gone. So that's why we need to make sure that we keep this up here. And we'll run it once more just to verify that it is still working properly. And there it is. And we'll wrap this lecture up by getting rid of the target sprite draw. We're going to be coming back to that in a little while because we want to draw the target sprite more programmatically rather than just at a static position. I hope you didn't forget, but there is one more asset that we need to load into our game, and that's galleryfont.spritefont. In order to draw text to the game window in Monogame, you have to utilize a type of file known as a sprite font. What these are are basically blueprints for Monogame to follow in order to understand how the text will be drawn, like what size the text will be and which font to use. I want you to go find the galleryfont.spritefont file that you downloaded. I'm not talking about this X and B that we put into the content folder, I'm talking about the one that you actually downloaded from the lecture before. Um, if you can't find it anywhere on your computer, you should actually be able to find it in the content file, where if you open the folder in File Explorer, uh, then here it is. So here's the X and B, this is the file that we see over here on the side, but this is the actual sprite font file, and you can see that over here. So I want you to edit this, you can either you can open it in some kind of text editor. I'm going to use Notepad++. Um, if you don't have any text editor to edit with, you could potentially drag it into Visual Studio and that would work as well. But if we take a look at this, it's actually more like an XML document. It has a bunch of these tags like font name and size and spacing. And these are different values that we can assign to the sprite font, which is basically defining what the sprite will look like in the game. For example, we have the font name is Arial, which of course is just one of the fonts that we can use on any kind of computer program, and the font size is 24. So any of these different properties of the sprite font, you can just adjust by changing whatever is between the two tags. So like regular, we can change that to something else, like bold or italic if we wanted to. As it is, this is a pretty basic sprite font file that we're using for this game, but it gets the job done. Now, if you want to make your own sprite font, you can either duplicate this file that I provided for you, or what I used to generate this is if you open up the content pipeline, and then you go over to content, you can right click and choose add new item, and then you have a few different options here, but if you choose sprite font description dot sprite font and you click OK, it has it generated this called file dot sprite font. So this is just the default one. And you could you could even open this with a different program, like I could open it with WordPad, for example, and this is what the default sprite font file would look like that's generated by the content pipeline. but we don't need that right now, so I'm going to just delete it. Going back to our code, let's load in 
this gallery font, that X and B sprite font into our game. And we do that pretty similarly to how we loaded in the texture 2Ds. Up here, we're going to write in a new variable, sprite font, and we'll call this game font. Next, we need to actually load it in using the load content method. So we'll do game font, was what we named it, equals content.load. And then between here is the data type, which is sprite font. And then between the parentheses, we just put the title or the name of the file that we're loading in, which is gallery font, just like this. Once again, we didn't put .x and b at the end of this file name. Since all of the included files are .x and b's, it's able to extrapolate what we're talking about. Now for the line that actually draws the text. Again, this is similar to before. We have to call spritebatch.begin, like we did here, but then we're going to call spritebatch.drawString this time. So before we were doing draw, and this is used for textures, but draw string we're going to use for our sprite fonts. So the first parameter is the font we want to use, which is game font. The next parameter is the text that we want to say. So we'll make it say test message for now. Then the next thing is the position, and this is also a vector 2. So we'll do new vector 2, and we'll put it at 100, 100 for now, since we're just testing this out. And then the color, I'm going to put it to color.white again. But again, you're able to choose whatever color you want. So once, once we save that, we can try it out. And there it is. There's the text that we drew to the screen. So just to reiterate, game font was the font we used, which it's the Arial size 24. The message was test message. The position is 100, 100, which is 100 pixels to the right, 100 pixels down. And then the color is white. So a couple lectures ago, we drew the target sprite to the screen at a specific position. The thing is, the target is going to be changing positions every time it gets shot. So we can't just hard code the target to appear at position 0, 0 or something. Instead, we need to make the target's position a variable. That way, whenever the target gets shot, we can update its position to be somewhere else on the screen. To do this, let's go to the top where we have all these variables defined, and we're going to make a vector 2 target position equals new vector 2 and we'll start off at 300 300 so this created the vector 2 target position variable and we also initialized it to contain the value of a new vector at position 300 300 i know this syntax for new vector 2 seems a little bit strange but when we talk about classes and objects in a later lecture, it'll make more sense to you then. Now that there's a target position variable, let's use it to draw the target sprite. Back down in the draw section, we're going to write in oops, sprite batch dot draw, and we're going to put in the target sprite. And now for the position, we're going to use that target position variable. So we can just say target position, like that. Since target position is a vector 2, it'll fit perfectly in as a parameter for this method. And then finally the color, which is color.white. And then go ahead and save. And it should be good to go, so we can go ahead and click start. And there's our target. It's located at position 300, 300, and it's using this target position variable that we created. Now that it's a variable, it'll be very helpful in the future whenever we want to change its position to be somewhere else on the screen. There is one more aspect of the target that we should have stored in a variable, and that's its radius. Since the target is a circle, its radius is the distance from the center to the edge. Having this value on hand will be helpful in the coming lectures because we'll be performing some calculations based on the target's size. 
So I figured now would be a good time for us to get this variable set now the way. So go back up to the top where all of our variables are, and we're going to create a new variable called int because the radius is going to be an integer. We'll call it target radius like this, and we're going to set it equal to 45. I got the number 45 because if you look at the target image, it's with as 90 pixels. Therefore, the radius is 45, which is just 90 divided by 2. Now, we could just leave it like this, and that would be completely fine, but this variable is a bit special. See, throughout the course of the game, this variable isn't going to change. The target is always going to be the same size, so the radius is always going to be 45. So when we have a variable in our program that will never change, it's good practice to make it a constant variable. When a variable is constant, that means its value can't be changed anywhere in your code. And putting the const keyword right before this, like that, is all you need to do in order to make a constant. In addition to this, it is somewhat standard to make any constant variables in all capital letters, like we'll make this target radius. Some people are sticklers about that and some aren't. I'd say it's a good idea to get into that habit. And that's about all we need in order to set up the target variables. Having these on hand will prove to be very useful in the coming lectures. In addition to that, if we ever change the sprite for the target to something else and the size is different, all we have to do is change this one variable in our code and the new radius will work everywhere else in the program. In this lecture, we're going to go through how to get input from the mouse, or in other words, how the player will be able to click on the screen in order to make something happen. Since this game is a shooting gallery sort of game, it works by having the player click on the targets to shoot them, so let's learn how to make this happen. First, we need to talk about how the mouse communicates with the game. Mono game is able to tell what the mouse is doing at all times, and we as a programmer are able to access the mouse's current state. When I say state, I mean what exactly the mouse is doing at that particular moment. This includes where on the screen the mouse is located, if the left or right button is pressed down, if the scroll wheel is being used, and other cases as well. By looking at the mouse's state, we're able to determine what our game should do. In order to access the mouse's state information, we need to create a variable for it. So up here at the top, we're going to make a new variable called mouse state. That's the data type, and then we're going to call it mState. So this is the variable that we're going to store the mouse's state in. Now in order to give it the value we want, which is the current state of the mouse, we're actually going to do this assignment in the update method. Because we want this to be updated every single frame. This will be your first exposure to working in the update section of the game. So just as a reminder, all the code that is written inside here gets executed every frame of the game. These sections up top get ran once, right when the game starts. But update and draw are different in that they are constantly running and being updated. That being said, let's put in the line mState, which is that mouse state object we created, equals mouse.getState, like this. So this line uses mouse.getState, which, as the name implies, returns the current state of the mouse. And since mState is being set equal to this, that means that when this line runs, mState will contain the current mouse state. And this is the reason we put it in the update function. Every single frame, this line of code is going to run. Therefore, this variable is always going to be up to date about where the mouse is and which of its buttons are currently being pressed. And now that we have this information easily accessible, let's actually do something with it. Let's start with something easy. How about we make a variable, and whenever the player clicks the mouse, that variable increases. So let's make a new variable at the top. We're going to call it int score. And we'll start off at 0. So what we want is to increase the value of score every time the player clicks the mouse. Back in the update function, we're going to utilize mState to do this. After this line, we're going to test to see if the mouse's left button is down. And if it is, that must mean the player clicked. We're going to use an if statement to do this. So we're going to write if mState.leftButton 
is equal to button state dot pressed. So here's what this line is saying. M state is of course the same variable as right here. It just got updated to be equal to the mouse's current state. And then by saying dot left button, we're accessing the left button value that this M state has, which tells us if that left button on the mouse at that current frame is down or not. Then we're testing to see if it's equal to button state dot pressed, which left button is either set to button state dot pressed or button state dot released. So if it's pressed, then that means we want score to increase just like this. And if you recall from the programming lecture on arithmetic, this variable plus plus is just a notation that means increase the value of the variable by one. So this means that when the left button is pressed on the mouse, the score will increase by one. So let's save and we're going to run the game as it is. Now, before we try anything, it really bugs me that whenever you put the mouse over the game window, it disappears. This is a setting that Monogame has by default where it hides the mouse whenever the mouse hovers over the game window. We can change this up in the constructor. Right here, we can do is mouse visible, and we can set it to true. By default, this value is false. But by setting it to true in the game constructor, that'll make it true, of course, meaning we'll be able to see it. So let's try running once more. Now when we hover the mouse over the window, we can see it still. So we can click all we want, and maybe the score is increasing, but we can't tell. We don't know what score is at the given moment because we can't see it on screen or anything. Let's make it so that we can actually see the value on the screen. We're going to recycle this drawstring call right here. See, we were just writing in test message, but let's give it something more interesting like the score. See, if we put the score in here, we'll be able to see what its value is because it's being drawn to the screen as text. But there is a slight problem, and that's that score is an integer. See, it, this method wants a string value here, but score is an integer and it can't convert from an integer to a string on the fly. There is an easy way around this though, and that's simply to call dot to string like this. This to string method will take whatever's before it, which is an integer, and then it will convert into a string. So this is the same thing as this as a string, which will print out the score to the screen. Now if we run and try it again, it's displaying zero, which is the default value for the score. Now let's try clicking. Well, every time you click, it does go up, so it is sort of working. But really what's happening is whenever you hold it down, if you hold down the, val or hold down the button, it increases every moment that it's down. And this is because we put this score increase in the update method. Remember, update gets updated every single frame the game runs. And since the way we wrote our code right here was if the left button is down, increase the score. Well, that means that every frame, it, all it's gonna do is test if the button's down, increase the score, meaning it's gonna increase it 60 times per second. And I think a better way to do this would be to only increase it once every time you click the button. Here's how we're gonna get around this. We're going to create a new variable that keeps track of whether or not the mouse's left button is released or not. So we're going to do bool m released. And actually, we're going to start it off as true because we're assuming that the player does not have the left mouse button pressed immediately. Now, go down to the update method where that logic for increasing the score happens. And we're going to add to this if statement right here to account for this um, new m released variable that we created. What we can do is we can say and m released is equal to true. So this is a little bit different. It's actually testing two different conditions at the same time. That's what this and operator does. 
it makes sure that both conditions are true in order for the inside of the curly braces to happen. So in this case, in order for the score to increase, the left mouse button has to be pressed down and our M released variable has to be true. And there are other operators other than and, such as this. This is or, meaning as long as one of these conditions is true, then it'll continue on. But we need both of them to be true in order for this to happen. Now, we only want this score to increase once per frame. So if we set M released to false in here, that means once this is once this is true, the score will increase by one, then M release will be set to false, meaning that the next frame that this comes around, M release is going to be false, meaning that this will no longer be true, meaning that none of this is true. So it, the score is only going to increase by one. So if we try it now, and we click, it increased by one, but that's it. And it doesn't work properly because we can't click anymore and nothing else happens. However, the concept of all of this worked perfectly well because it only did it once. What needs to happen though is we need to reset this M release back to true whenever the player releases the mouse. And this is the same idea as what we just did. We're gonna do another if statement here and say if M state dot left button is equal to button state dot released then we'll set m released to true so now this is how this update method will go if the player has the left mount the left mouse button down and this m release is true which it starts off as true then the score will increase and then m release will be false so the next frame even if he leaves the left mouse button pressed this won't execute anymore because M released is now false. But every frame as well, it's going to check and see if the left button is released. And if the left mouse button is released, then this M released variable will be set to true, meaning that the next frame, this can potentially happen again if they press the mouse button down. So if we save and run, and I click, I can keep holding down the mouse button and nothing else happens. It only increases the score right when I click. So this works. In the next lecture, we're going to apply what we just did here in order to make it so we can shoot the target. As of now, we can click anywhere on the screen and our score increases. Let's make it so that this only happens when we click inside the target here. So here's a little brain teaser for you. When we click the mouse, how can we tell that the mouse is on top of the target? Sure, it's easy for us as humans to tell because we can just look and see, but how can we make it so our program can tell? Here's a hint. We need to utilize the position of the target and the position of the mouse. We have the X and Y coordinates of both. Using that information, how can we know that the mouse is over top of the target? It's little questions like these that make programming so much fun. You just have to sit back for a moment and think about the data you have available and how you can use that data to get the answers you want. Here's what I'm thinking. If the mouse is close enough to the center of the target, then it's a hit. But obviously, if it's too far away, then it won't be a hit. Specifically, if the distance between the mouse and the target is less than the size of the radius, then the mouse must be over top the target. Here's an illustration I whipped up to show you what I'm talking about. These X's here represent where the mouse is. This purple rectangle is the radius of the circle, or I should say the target. And this horizontal line is the distance between the center of the circle to the mouse. Now, in this case on the left here, this is the mouse and this is the target. Obviously, the mouse is not inside the tar target. And we can tell because the distance between the center to the mouse is greater than the radius. See how the red bar is longer than the purple bar. And then over here, the X is inside the target, and the green bar, representing the distance from the center to the mouse, is smaller than the radius. If we use that principle, 
then it's going to be very easy for us to tell whether or not the mouse is on top of the target or not. So in here, this is where the mouse press happens. So it's in here that we need to do this test for the distance between the mouse and the center of the target. We're going to get rid of the score increase for now, so we're just left with this. Now in here, we're going to want to do another if statement, and this is where we're going to do that test. In order to do this calculation though, we're going to need to store some data in some variables to make it more easy to work with. So up at the top we're going to make another variable, and we're going to call it float mouse target dist. Notice that I made this variable a float rather than an integer. This calculation will most likely not return a solid integer or whole number, and we need to account for that. So a float can make it a decimal value, potentially. Now back down to the update method. Right around here, we're going to update that variable we just created. So we'll do mouse target dist. Now what this variable is going to contain is the distance between the mouse and the target. And luckily for us, there's a very easy way to calculate this. Since both the mouse and the target contain vector 2s to describe their position, we can use this method called vector2.distance. And this method takes in two different vector2 values and returns the distance between them. So if we put in target position, and then now we'll need to put in the mouse position. But here's the thing. The M state doesn't store a vector 2 for the position. It stores them separately, like M state.x or M state.y. But M state.position is not a vector 2. It's a point. So we can't use it for this method right here. So what we need to do is utilize the new vector2 syntax. So we can say new vector2 and then utilize the values from mState, mState.x, mState.y, and then don't forget the semicolon. So this equates to a vector2 representing the x and y coordinates of the mouse state of that current frame. And this whole long thing equals the distance between the target's position and the mouse's position. So now that we have the mouse target dist, we can actually go back to this if statement that we started right here. And remember, we're testing to see if the distance between the mouse and the center of the target is less than the radius of the target. So we're going to test if mouse target dist is less than target radius. And remember, it was all caps because it's a constant value. And then if it is, we're going to increase the score. Score plus plus. And that should do it. By doing this test right here, the score should only increase when we click if it's on top of the target. So if we save and run, and if we go down here to the target, and we click on it, it increases. And if we go off the target, it does not increase. But you'll notice that some parts of the target work and some parts don't. This is a little bit weird, isn't it? That up here in the upper left corner, it seems to work more, but down here in the right, it's not. And this has to do with the origin of the target being in its upper left-hand corner. See, sprites are drawn from the upper left-hand corner of the image. We specified the point 300, 300 for this target, and that point is right here in the game world. We give Monogame the point 300, 300, and then it places the upper left-hand corner of the image at that point. To illustrate this further, let's change the target to be at position 0, 0. 0, 0. Save, and then run. See, the upper left-hand corner of this target sprite is right up at the very upper left-hand corner. And remember that zero, 0, is the origin right up at the corner. 
but we should really want the center of the target to be at 0, 0 right now. That would make this calculation work because then the hitbox for the target would overlap the actual image rather than be up here instead. There's a pretty easy fix for this. All we have to do is draw the target at a slightly different position. Specifically, if we draw the target so that the center, right here, corresponds with its position, right here, then everything will be fine. Let's take a look at the draw sprite for the target, which is down here, right here. See, we draw it at target position, which right now it's at zero, zero. We're actually going to change this a little bit. Instead of doing just target position, we're going to make a new vector 2, and we're going to use those coordinates a little bit right here. We're going to say target position, same variable as before, but we're going to say dot x minus the target radius. That would move the sprite over to the left so that the center corresponds with the actual position. And then we're going to do the same thing for the y coordinate target position dot y minus target radius. And remember, target radius is just half of the width and height of the image itself. So this moves the image to the left by half its width and up by half its width, which if, if we did that correctly, puts the target right here where the center is now at zero, zero, its actual position. And if we click on it anywhere, it'll increase. But we can't really tell that really well right now because it's hiding up in the corner. So let's change it back to that 300, 300 so we can actually click on it. Okay, clicking around it doesn't do anything, but clicking on the target does. And you can click anywhere on here and it'll work because now the actual hitbox corresponds with the actual image. So now that our target is able to be clicked on, let's start making a game out of this by making it jump around whenever we shoot it. When we shoot the target, we want it to jump to a brand new random position. We can do this by utilizing the random class. In order to do this though, we need to add a new namespace to the top of the file. See up here we have a few lines saying using and then some package name. These are called namespaces. They're a collection of tools that we can include into our file and use. The ones by default are XNA namespaces or ones that we need to make games with Monogame. We're going to add one more at the very top. Using system. This is one of the more common ones, and it happens to have the random class that we need. And when we have this line in our program, we'll be able to access it. Now go down to the section where the score increases, which is right here. We're going to add a new random object by writing random rand equals new random, just like this. Here, random is the class name and rand is the name of the variable. But when you use a class name to make a variable, it's technically called an object. But we'll talk about that when we get into detail about classes. Regardless, we can now use this rand object to generate random numbers. So in this next line, we're going to change the position of the target. And keep in mind that it's here that the player just shot the target and the score increased. So it makes sense to change the position here. Before we use the rand object though, let's start up with a simple example and just write target position dot x equals 100 and target position dot y equals 100. So th with this in place, when we shoot the target, its position is going to change to 100, 100. And let's actually test it out real quick. All right, there's our target. Click on it, and it changes to 100, 100. But now, whenever we click on it again, it just keeps jumping to 100, 100, and it doesn't go anywhere after that. What we want to do is make it so that instead of doing 100, 100 for these two lines, we want it to be some random number. 
So we're going to utilize rand to do this and do rand.next and then we'll do 0 to 200 just to start. When we use rand.next, we put in two numbers. The first one is the minimum value and the top or in the second one is the maximum value. This is the range of possible values that this random object can generate. So this is going to generate some random integer between 0 and 200. And note that the maximum value actually isn't inclusive, so it'll actually be 0 to 199. And we're going to do the same thing to this line as well, rand.next, 0 to 200. And if we save and run, we'll try it out. Okay, we'll click on it. It jumps to a random position. Click on it again. It's another random position. So it's doing kind of what we want, except it's only doing a very small range. It's only doing the range of uh, 0 to 200 and 0 to 200. What we want it to actually do is take up this entire window. So here at this 200, we actually want it to be the width of the screen, 0 to the width. And we can get the width pretty easily if we do graphics dot preferred back buffer width preferred back buffer width and height is the same idea graphics dot preferred back buffer height this will get the width and height of our window and remember this this maximum value is not included we it's zero to one less than that so if we do plus one right here, it'll actually go to the very edge. And remember, adding one to just to this does not change the width of the screen. It just changes it for this context. If we wanted to change the width of the screen, we'd have to set this variable equal to something else in order to adjust it. So let's save and run it now. And we'll click. And now it's going all over the screen. It's much better. You may notice though that occasionally it'll go off screen like this. I want to keep it so that it's the entire target will always be on screen and it won't go off. The reason it's kind of going off is because remember this, the position of the target is at the very center. And if we say that the position can go from this very edge to this very edge or this very edge to this very edge, there's nothing stopping that position from being like at zero. In that case, half of the target can't be seen. So instead of going from the very edge to the very edge, we could go from like around here to here. And the distance we need to move over is the radius of the target. That would keep the entire thing completely in sight at all times. So now, instead of zero right here, we're going to put target radius, meaning that the minimum value that this number could be is 45. And then we want to actually subtract the radius from this. We don't want it to go all the way to the edge. So if we subtract target radius, just like that, now it'll go from 45 to whatever the width is minus 45. And then this plus one makes it inclusive. And we'll do the same thing right here. Whoops, target radius. Okay, I'll run it one more time. And I'll click around. And it's hard to really know for sure, but it looks like this is about as close as it can get. See the center of the target will always be at least this far away, at least a radius length away from an edge. So it'll never overlap. That about wraps up everything that I wanted to cover in this video. Thanks for sticking through to the end with me. Although we've covered a lot about making games with Monogame, there's still so much to this framework that we haven't touched on, and so many great features that are fundamental to any good game. If you're interested in diving deeper into what Monogame has to offer, 
then I recommend checking out my full course on udemy.com called Monogame Introduction to C Sharp Game Programming. The course features all the same footage that you saw in this video, but with so much more, coming to a total of more than 8 hours of video lectures. In these videos, we will continue on and finish up this shooting gallery game by adding a timer, adding the crosshairs, and adding some general polish to the whole game. After that, we move on to create two more games, the first being a top-down spaceship game, and the second being an action shooter RPG. There are so many important development concepts discussed in these videos, including character movement, getting keyboard input, timers, making enemies and hazards, shooting projectiles, object collisions, animating a character, implementing a camera, having a health and damage system, and using tiled to design levels. And this doesn't even include all the C-sharp programming content that is provided. There are three programming sections, one for each game, each discussing the relevant coding concepts you'll need to create the next project. Everything you need to create your own games with Monogame is here. If you're interested, there's a link to this course in the description of this video, and using that will apply a discount code. Take a look and see if this course is something that you'd be interested in. All Udemy courses come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving the course a try. If you have any questions, leave a comment on this video. And if you like the content here, be sure to hit the like button. Thanks so much for watching this tutorial, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.